Good morning. The time is now 12.01 p.m. and I will call the meeting of the District of Columbia Board of Ethics and Government Accountability Order. I'm Bega Chairperson Norma Hutchison. This meeting is being held at the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability at 1230 15th Street Northwest, Suite 700 West, and virtually. Joining me for this meeting are board members Charles Nottingham, Felice Smith, and Melissa Tucker. Together, we constitute a quorum for this meeting. Since it was first posted, the agenda has not changed. Board members, please take a moment to review the agenda, and then we'll need a motion to adopt the agenda. Make a motion to adopt the agenda. I'll second that motion. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the agenda for today's meeting. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any nays? Hearing none, the board has adopted the agenda for today's meeting. Before us today are the minutes from the March 2024 meeting draft minutes. And will a member please make a motion that we consider approval of these meeting minutes? I'll offer the motion that we approve the uh, meeting minutes from the prior meeting. Second that. It's been moved and seconded that we approve, consider approval of the min minutes from the March 2024 meeting. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any nays? Hearing none, the board approves the meeting from the minutes from the March 2024 meeting. Next, we'll hear a report from the Office of Open Government. Nikel Allen, Director of the Office of Open Government, will provide a report on behalf of the office. Director Allen, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Hudson and members of the board. I am Nikel Allen, Director of Open Government, and I am pleased to present this report on the activities of the Office of Open Government, or OOG. Since the last board meeting, OOG has continued to fulfill its mission of ensuring that all persons receive full and complete information regarding the affairs of the District of Columbia government and the actions of those who represent them. I will begin the report uh, with Open Meetings Act and Freedom of Information Act advice rendered by the office. OOG issued one advisory opinion, the dismissal of OOG complaint OOG-2024-005. On March 26, 2024, I dismiss a complaint against an advisory neighborhood commission because the allegations asserted were not within the scope of my authority under the Open Meetings Act. The merits of the complaint were not evaluated or considered because ANCs are not public bodies subject to the Open Meetings Act. The dismissal of the complaint is in Dropbox. Next is informal Open Meetings Act and Freedom of Information Act advice rendered by the office. Since the last board meeting, OOG has responded informally via email or telephone to requests for assistance as follows. We responded to nine requests from Open Meetings Act advice, four requests for FOIA advice, and 10 requests for assistance with open-dc.gov. The office's meeting monitoring activity is as follows. First is general monitoring. OOG staff attends public bodies meetings in person and remotely to ensure compliance with the Open Meetings Act. They also inspect public bodies websites and the, open, uh, the OOG's central meeting calendar for public meeting notices and records. OOG attorneys provide legal advice on OMA compliance and take corrective action if necessary. During March, 2024, OOG's legal staff attended 23 public body meetings. As a result of the monitoring, OOG communicated one corrective measure because a public body failed to post a detailed agenda. Second is the DC Council meeting regarding the deal with Monumental for the Washington Wizards and Washington Capitals to remain in DC. On April 1st, 2024, DC Council Chairman Mendelson assembled a majority of the DC Council members in his office to receive a briefing on the terms of the city's deal with Monumental Sports. There was no public notice of that meeting, which Chairman Mendelson described as a gathering. 
The Office of Open Government received inquiries regarding the legality of this meeting. The quote gathering was a meeting under the Open Meetings Act definition of a meeting. Under the Open Meetings Act definition, the gathering on April 1st was a meeting that is subject to the OMA because the majority of DC Council was present to consider, conduct, or advise on public business. However, while the DC Council's rules may support Chairman Mendelson's characterization of the event, the gathering of a quorum of council members in Chairman Mendelson's office to receive a briefing about the monumental deal was a meeting according to the OMA and arguably under the DC Council rules. An explanation follows. DC Official Code Section 2-575F provides that the council may promulgate its own rules regarding the conduct of its meetings, but the DC Council's rules must align with the Open Meetings Act definition of a meeting. The definition is set forth in DC Official Code Section 2-574, subsection 1, and reads as follows. Meeting means any gathering of a quorum of the members of the public body, including hearings and roundtables, whether formal or informal, regular, special, or emergency, at which the members consider, conduct, or advise on public business, including gathering information, taking testimony, discussing, deliberating, recommending, and voting. The DC Council has promulgated its own open meetings rule, Article 3H of the Rules of Organization and Procedure for the Council of the District of Columbia, Resolution 25-1. Those rules provide that certain DC Council activities where a quorum of the members convene do not require public notice. Rule 373A1 requires notice to the council secretary from one council member attending a meeting of the council at least 48 hours before the meeting unless emergency circumstances require less notice. However, Rule 373E excludes certain meetings from the notice provisions if the DC council members assembled do not take official action. Such meetings include, quote, administrative meetings, breakfast meetings, open discussions, or other gathering of the council when no official action is expected to take place. The gathering of the majority of the DC council on April 1st appears to fall within rule 373E based on the facts reported by the media. While I have not taken a formal position on the matter, I am providing this summary for the public's benefit since the matter is newsworthy. The Office of Open Government will continue to monitor this situation and I'll provide additional information if it is necessary. Uh, the next item in my report are training and outreach activities and it is as follows. As I reported last month, Sunshine Week was March 10th through 16th and OOG participated in these activities. Your right to know. On March 11th, a trial attorney, Nicholas Weil, attended a presentation concerning Pennsylvania open meetings and open records law. Octo coordinated an intra-district discussion of request processing technique. American Society of Access Professionals court case update. On March 12th, attorney Weil and I attended the ASFP webinar, ASCB Training for Members, Court Case Update. Attorneys Alan Bluestein and Ryan Mulvey provided a review of significant federal FOIA decisions. DC Government, I'm sorry, excuse me, DC Open Government Coalition Summit. On Wednesday, March 13th, I participated in a panel at the DC Open Government Coalition 2024 Sunshine Week Summit which OOG co-sponsored along with the Coalition and the Society of Professional Journalists. The panel addressed open government and public safety and included a DC Open Government Coalition board member who was also an attorney with the Washington Post, the director of Peace for DC and the deputy auditor for public safety. The course addressed issues relating to how transparency and public safety intersect in the district. 
the discussion highlighted the role transparency plays in empowering the community and our elected officials, public safety, and understanding crime and its effects. Chief Counsel Neal, Attorneys Weil and Skirbo attended the event. Shining a light, assessing government transparency in South Dakota and beyond. On March 14th, Attorney Weil attended the South Dakota News Media Association presentation, assessing government transparency in South Dakota. The appeals process steps to take when your FOIA requests are denied. On March 15th, Attorney Weil attended the National Press Club Journalism Institute's session on the appeals process when FOIA requests are denied. The next item is the Open Governance Newsletter. On March 14th, OOG issued, uh, released issue five of its newsletter, the Open Governance, which reports on OOG's activities and newsworthy events in the areas of open government. The newsletter also provides updates, including OOG's advisory opinions issued and advice rendered. Handling substantive and procedural motions in the District of Columbia. On March 21st, Attorney Weil attended this course presented by the DC Bar. The session focused on motion practice strategy in Superior Court. The session also highlighted substantive motions for temporary restraining orders, preliminary injunctions, dismissals, and summary judgments. FOIA training for Advisory Neighborhood Commission. On March 26th, I facilitated FOIA training for the Advisory Neighborhood Commissioners. OOG is required to train advisory neighborhood commissioners on FOIA twice a year. There were approximately ANC, uh, 30 ANC commissioners present at the virtual training, and the Office of ANCs provided ANC commissioners with access to the training recording and materials for those who were unable to attend. Gov delivery training for public records officers. On March 26, Attorney Scobro, Vegas records officer, attended this training on the email delivery system and content creation to train administrators. The training focused on topic creation, subscriber uploading, advanced template development, creation and sending, and analytics reporting. Open Meetings Act training for the DC Commission on Poverty. On March 26, Attorney Scobro presented this training to members of the DC Commission on Poverty. Executive Procurement Seminar. On March 26, Chief Counsel Neal attended an agency executive leadership training presented by the Office of Contracting and Procurement, which is designed to provide an overview of the District of Columbia's contracting and procurement laws, regulations, and procedures. Vega OGE Hatch Act Training. On April 2nd, Attorney Weil, Attorney Skirbo, and I attended virtual Hatch Act training, which was facilitated by the Office of Government Ethics. Open Meetings Act training for the Department of Licensing and Consumer Protection. On April 3rd, Attorney Skirbo presented Open Meetings Act training to members of public bodies and staff supported by the Department of Licensing and Consumer Protection. The legislation and litigation update is next. Litigation, the first case is DuBose versus the District of Columbia, case number 2018-CA-00378B. zero-zero-three-seven-eight-B. I have previously reported on this case involving the Board of Dentistry and their release of disciplinary records. The parties have begun filing their motion for summary judgment briefs concerning the issue of fees, and a motion hearing is set for May 31st. The parties' briefs are in Dropbox. Legislation is next. The proposed new DC FOIA exemption, physical and mental evaluations and reports, Bill 25-0545. I have previously reported on the Health Occupations Revision General Amendment Act of 2023. On March 21st, the Committee on Health reported out a draft that would add a new enumerated DC FOIA exemption, Exemption 21. This new exemption would apply to certain records related to the licensure of health professionals. These records include medical records, orders for fitness and pr to practice evaluations, other type of mental and physical evaluations, and the resulting reports. Certain consent orders, final orders, and notices of summary suspensions may be redacted under the new exemption to protect private or otherwise confidential information. On April 2nd, the council voted to engross the measure, i.e. first reading. The first passage is expected on May 7th. The committee report 
and the new bill, plus a later amendment by Councilmember Henderson, not Jermaine to FOIA, are in Dropbox. Continued allowance of streaming of virtual meetings, bills 25-0764 and 25-0765. I have reported before on the pandemic era amendment to the Open Meeting Act that recognizes streaming as a permissible means for public bodies to open their meetings to the public. On April 2nd, the DC Council passed emergency legislation to continue the applicability of this language and its companion measure passed on first reading. Council member Pinto stated the rationale for the legislation. She said, although the public health emergency has concluded, this authorization has provided public bodies with flexibility to determine the most efficient format for their meetings without reducing access for residents. In fact, largely providing a virtual option to attend meetings has increased access for many residents, including seniors, individuals with mobility issues, caregivers, individuals who are immunocompromised, and those who are ill. Although many public bodies have resumed in-person meetings, most continue to stream their meetings online or otherwise make the meeting available in a virtual format to allow residents to participate remotely. The bills, the emergency declaration resolution, and the request to agendize from Councilmember Pinto are in Dropbox. Uh, next is executive action, the FY 2023 Freedom of Information Act reports. The Attorney General and the Mayor of the District of Columbia transmitted the district's annual DC FOIA litigation report and the Freedom of Information Act report to the DC Council respectively. The reports are in Dropbox. Respecting the FOIA report, Vega's own individual data is reported beginning on page 35 of the PDF file. Um, the last item in my report are administrative matters, which is only one, the FY25 budget hearing. The D.C. Council's budget oversight hearing concerning Vega's FY25 budget will be held on April 8th before the Committee on Executive Administration and Labor. Vega Chairperson Hutcherson, Director Cooks, and I will provide information and testimony on Vega's FY25 budget needs. Vega has requested an FY25 budget enhancement request to fund an additional OOG attorney advisor position we are also advocating for a change to the enforcer provision of the OMA that will provide a $1,000 fine for each violation of the OMA. This concludes the Office of Open Government April 4th, 2024 report. I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have at this time. Thank you, Director Allen. Are there any questions for Director Allen? That's a question. At the beginning of your presentation, thank you. You talked about a recent uh, uh, open meetings uh, act potential problem at council. Could you just elaborate? I mean, I think we're all generally familiar with the news development of important economic development uh, matters before the council involving the uh, um, arenas and stadiums, uh, monumental. Did this come to us? Was there a complaint, or uh, did you did we take just did we notice that something looked unusual? Or I guess where are we on this? Yes, we have received a complaint. Um, We've also received several inquiries about what happened and was it legal, um, which we've responded to. Um, but given the volume of interest, I thought it would be prudent to just provide an overview of what the state of the law is. Um, we haven't come to a conclusion about the validity of the meeting yet, um, but we are looking into it. Uh, our authority with the council is different than with other public bodies. So we have to keep that in mind in, in figuring out uh, what our course of action here is on that on that meeting. So it sounds like a situation where. Let's say so the council occasionally has to deal with fast moving matters that aren't always. Easy to harmonize with with a lot of notice, et cetera, but it's. It's why we have these laws, right? It's why we have your office. Thank you. Um, but um, I guess not to be, not to be a no. I don't. My purpose here is not to be second guess or anything, but just in normal course of 
council business, if something is a fast moving matter that requires quick council um, uh, attention by a quorum, um, what's the, uh, how should they proceed? Well, they've excluded particular meetings from notice. Their public notice is different than what we would consider public notice under the Open Meetings Act. They just have to provide notice to the secretary. In a fast moving situation under their rules, I would assume that they would provide that notice to the secretary at the same time they provided to the other members. And that would satisfy their notice provisions under their rules. Um, they are certainly permitted even under the Open Meetings Act to have an emergency meeting, as you all know, um, all that's required there is the same notice to the public that's required to the members and a statement of what the emergency actually is. So even under the Open Meetings Act, there is a, a permissibility to meet uh, spur of the moment if there is an emergency. And would there be a, um, in that kind of a situation, there would be an expectation that at the point in time where a quorum of council members are invited to a gathering to talk about uh, district business. <clears throat> is that the point in time? Presumably there was a communication. It wasn't just a uh, accidental meetup in a, right. an elevator or something. Um, so would that have been the time to then also notice the secretary of the council or to either declare it an emergency or? Yes, when it's an emergency meeting, all of those things kind of happen simultaneously um, to give the public notice. Uh, in this case, the chairman has said these particular meetings, no notice is required at all. And there's another um, issue that is at play is the content of that meeting. It, not knowing anything else other than what the public knows, it seems like it could be the type of meeting that would have been excluded from the Open Meetings Act from a, a public meeting. So they could have properly noticed and said this is just a closed meeting um, and their own procedures actually do set forth that they should go in a public uh, meeting and state that they are going into closure of the reason and vote just as we do. Um, so I think if they would have done that in this situation, it could have quelled some of the uh, concern the public has, um, but their position is under this subsection E these meetings, you're not even required to do any of that. Um, so I think communication with the public in this interest, in this instance, given the gravity of the moment, probably would have been a, a good idea uh, on the part of the DC Council uh, member Mendelson, Chairman Mendelson, excuse me, when he was calling that meeting in his office um, before the monumental announcement. Okay. To err on the side of transparency. Right. Thank you. And again, my purpose is not to embarrass anybody or to assign blame or I just want to I can imagine that this is a point of some interest and some potential confusion on the part right. of the public and I guess my main concern would be as the agency that has is in the point with responsibility to speak to these kind of open meeting act issues where do we go from here to address confusion questions about this what the future expectations might be for similar type gatherings of quorums or district businesses discussed. I mean, in other words, is this, do we put this in a file and never talk about it again or lessons get learned or is there a expectation that something happens differently the next time or is this literally a, are we at an impasse where a member of council feels that the law says one thing and we pull it may say another, but it's awkward and we, I just, where do we go from here, I guess? Okay, we haven't gotten to that point okay. yet. Um, we haven't um, discussed the matter with the council or the council's general counsel yet. Um, that's our next step uh, is to find out what happened um, from them, which we do from any public body. Uh, and then if it's warranted, we could issue an advisory opinion. Um, if the board uh, would, like, would also like to request us that we can do that. Um, that's something that we're most likely going to do. Uh, given the newsworthiness and public interest uh, in the issue. And again, the council's rules versus what we do every day here, the Open Meetings Act is somewhat different. Um, so I think there is a public interest uh, in knowing what those rules are and, and how they work. And we are certainly um, happy to provide the public with that information and guidance. 
uh, but we don't have all the facts. Just we we just have what was reported um, in the news, just like everyone else. But we are going to to find uh, find out uh, what happened. Thanks. I, I, I'm sure you will. But if you could keep a surprise with this, absolutely, this, to see closure at some point, kind of know what the expectations are going forward. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions, Director Allen? Add very briefly. It sounds like. I'm understanding there's a real conflict here between the DC Council rules and the other rules, and the council is a public body, so it's subject to both. I guess what you're looking at is whether one supersedes the other, or what we do in a conflict situation like that. Well, the way the rule is written, um, subsection two dash uh, two seven five one, just is the definition of an open meeting, and within that rule. Uh, the rule regarding the council, it says they can issue their own rules, but they just have to follow that one section. So theoretically, they don't really have to do anything else. Um, and you, to, in their defense, most of their the rules in the council rules do mirror the language of the Open Meetings Act. Um, it's just kind of where the rub is is this particular issue and these kind of series of meetings that they have that are unique um, breakfast meetings is one of those that's there, but they usually have the press there um, at those meetings. So that automatically follows the definition of uh, the open meetings act. But because I think this because this happened so fast and there seem to be some different rules um, that they have that could have been at play, I think that complicates um, things. They seem to have a procedure that they could have followed um, in this particular matter that would have made it less controversial, um, but they have every right with the chairman within his role to call his meetings as uh, he sees fit um, if they're in compliance with the law. So again, we don't know exactly. He could have provided some notice to the secretary. There are a lot of things that he could have done. We're just speculating um, at this point because we haven't um, done our fact finding. That's very helpful, and I, I suspect that those emergency procedures we were talking about typically apply to when something is being voted on, a piece of legislation or something. Correct. And because there was no voting here and it was sort of yes. briefing, it seems like that. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, they did not take any official action in the meeting in the chairman's office. It was a briefing. Um, so that, that exception does say there needs to be um, no official action for it to be able uh, to apply. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we'll hear from the director of the Office of Government Ethics, Ashley Cooks. Director Cooks, please proceed. Hey, members of the board, I'm Ashley Cooks, director of government ethics, and I'm pleased to present this report on the activities of the Office of Government Ethics. First is an update on the status of OGE operations. The information reported today regarding OGE's cases will not be that may occur because of actions taken by the board during today's meeting. For open investigations by status, we have a grand total of 35 matters. Open undocumented matters. Next, pending state investigations by status, we have 40 matters that are closed pending election, six matters that are stayed pending DC Superior Court case, one matter stayed for OAG False Claims Act case, five matters stayed for IG investigation for a grand total of 52 matters. Regulatory matters by status, we have 41 matters that are closed pending collection for a grand total of 41. Again, we currently have 35 open investigations and 11 investigations that are stayed. The number of open preliminary informal investigations includes eight new matters. The investigative team resolved 17 investigations since the board last met. This total does not reflect the number of complaints that were dismissed for a lack of jurisdiction. OGE has continued its communications and referrals to the Chief Financial Officer Central Collection Unit, CCU, for collection of delinquent debts. We have commenced monthly meetings with the CCU team and learned that approximately $3,000 has been collected to date. We are transferring over new debts and will continue to update them monthly. Intends to publish its quarterly complaint report for the second quarter of fiscal year 2024, which ended last week prior to the next board meeting. Next is an update on trainings and outreach. First, professional development trainings attended by staff. 
Tonight, the Titus completed past prior course. Auditor Courtney Walker attended emotional agility. Investigator Ileana Carreras took three courses from Whitlander Linsky. The first is respect inside the, in the interview room, uh, maintaining positive relationships, and mentor the mentees in the investigative field. Attorney advisor Marisa Jones took ethics update, practicing law in the virtual world by the National White Collar Crime Center. She also took financial fraud, trends, targets, and technology given by the state of Alabama Bar and navigating AI ethical challenges and risks from field saw. Attorney advisor Fran Van attended strategic listening for lawyers. Attorney advisor Maurice Eccles took the de deposition for experts given by the Attorney General for the District of Columbia. Supervisor Attorney H. Mitchell for family coaching and program support assistant Titus completed catalyst design offered by LRN, the company that created and hosts our learning management system. General Counsel Rachi Raj took the QA popular user overview training, a global connect section entitled Journalism and Ethics, the 2024 Annual Sexual Harassment Officer Training, and Meyer Briggs Type Indicator Training via the, the, via the Department of Human Resources. Senior Board Attorney Lynn Tran attended lobbying and political activities focused on limitations and prohibitions in the nonprofit sector and two gov delivery courses, feature focus and administrative training. For trainings conducted by staff, since the March board meeting, OGE conducted nine training courses, included a March local hashtag training, monthly ethics training, two trainings for the DC National Guard, two trainings for the DC Office of Risk Management, a lobbyist training, the April hashtag training, and an ethics training for the DC Office of Administrative Hearings. March 54 employees courses using the learning management system. The courses with the highest completion rates were conflicts of interest, negotiating employment, and the general ethics training. 60 employees completed our ethics training using PeopleSoft. For outreach, OGE is in the process of updating and implementing new training courses for the learning management system. As I previously stated, OGE staff members, staff members attended a Catalyst design course as the, as the first step to updating those training courses. Supervisory Attorney Asia Stewart Mitchell is the point of contact for this project and has begun updating the financial disclosure statement training. The LMS has provided the opportunity to train and reach a broader audience of employees. With these updates, our goal is to fine-tune the ethics information we provide and increase the number of courses that are available on the system. Next is an update on advisory opinions and advice. First, informal advice. OGE legal staff provided approximately uh, provided advice for approximately 31 ethics inquiries, which is four less than the 35 reported at the last board meeting. This number does not include responses we have provided to questions regarding the lobbyist and FTS e filing system. Formal advisory opinions. Last month, OGE published advisory opinion cooperation and retaliation, which discusses the obligation of district employees to cooperate with OGE investigation against retaliating against employees who report unethical conduct and cooperate with investigations. The opinion completed its 30 day comment period without any feedback and finalized on March 23rd. On March 29th, OGE published an advisory opinion entitled Guidance on Social Media for Official Purposes by District Government and Elected Officials and District Government Employees. The 30-day comment period extends through April 29th, and a few comments have already been received. The opinion is complicated by a recent Supreme Court opinion from March 15th, so revisions and a second comment period may be necessary. A copy of the advisory opinion was, um, and the recent Supreme Court opinion were placed in the box. Next update on legislation and rulemaking. Uh, we only have one that's the financial disclosure rulemaking. OGE has identified 
commission members that do not meet the definition of public official under DC Code Section 1-1161.0147 and don't file financial disclosure forms, even though they engage in conduct that creates a financial conflict of interest or the appearance of conflict. OTE drafted a proposed rulemaking that would designate those board and commission members as public financial disclosure statement filers, and it was posted in the D.C. Register on March 29, 2024, for a 30-day comment period. Uh, we also emailed all the ethics counselors, and a press release was posted on the BEGA website. To date, we have not received any comments. Next is an update on OTE administrative matters. Uh, the the only one is the 2025 budget oversight hearing. Vega has received a date to appear before the Committee on Executive Administrative Administration and Labor for an FY budget oversight hearing on Monday, April 8, 2024. Both OOG and OGE will provide the information and testimony on the agency and FY25 budget enhancement request. Next is an update on financial disclosure statement, FDS. Pursuant to DC official code sections 1-1162.24 and 1-116.25, public officials and certain government employees must file a financial disclosure statement as a means of transparency and to prevent engaging in conduct that violates the financial conflicts of interest statute. That is public officials who meet the statutory requirement of their annual financial disclosure statement. The 2024 FDS season is underway. The 2024 financial disclosure statements for calendar year 2023 are due on May 15th, 2024. Most agencies have provided their list of designated buyers. Of the list received, agencies have reported 8,444 filers which is, five, which is a 5% increase over 2023. To date, 270 filers have already completed their filing and 22 supports have been received. OGE will send mail notices to public filers sometime next week and will, and will send email notices on April 15th. Next is an update on lobbying, registration, and reporting. Uh, pursuant to the official code section 1-11, 62.27a, a person who receives compensation or expends funds in an amount of $250 or more in three consecutive calendar month period for lobbying shall register with the Director of Government Ethics and pay the required registration fee. According to DC Official Code Section 1-1162.30, each registrant shall file a quarterly report concerning the registrant's lobbying activity for the previous quarter. Lobbying reporting has remained steady since the start of the, excuse me, since the start of the 2024 calendar year. The 2024 first quarter activity reports are due April 15, 2024. A final reminder was sent to 373 recipients on March 27, 2024. As of this report, a handful have filed their quarterly activity reports. On March 20th, 2024, Attorney Advisor Echo and Coordinator Kosick hosted 31 attendees at the LRR quarterly training. This session focused on the DC code and how to file. OGE sent to all registrant lobbyists and their clients um, notice informing them of that the 15 day grace period that was allotted during the COVID 19 pandemic would end on April 1st, 2024 and fines will be imposed on the day after the filing deadline. A press release is also issued. And last, our public investigation. Uh, the first one is 24-0006F, in Basis Later. Uh, this is a formal investigation based on a criminal complaint that Vincent Slater accepted bribes to erase or change tax obligations of several DC businesses. Mr. Slater was a senior revenue officer at the D.C. Office of Tax and Revenue. Uh, Mr. Slater's sentencing is scheduled for April 18, 2024, and OGE will update the board at the next meeting. Next is 24-0007F, Henry Mark Davis. 
This is a formal investigation based on a criminal complaint that Mark Davis, a uh, Metropolitan Police Officer, worked a second job at Giant while on duty with MPD between August 27, 2021 and June 7, 2023. According to the criminal complaint, Mr. Davis engaged in a scheme and systematic course of conduct with the intent to defraud the district government by means of false or fraudulent pretense and thereby obtaining property of a value of $100 or more consisting of money. Mr. Davis fraudulently earned $56.14 from NPD while simultaneously working at Giant. The next court hearing will take place on April 22nd. Last public matter is uh, 24-0008F and Reed Terrica Clark. This is a formal investigation based on a criminal complaint that Terrica Clark, MPD's civilian employee in the Internal Affairs Bureau, worked a full-time full -time job at MES Energy Services. Ms. Clark worked for MPD from 7 a.m. to 3.30 p.m which included her teleworking on Mondays and Fridays and reporting to the office Tuesday through Thursday. She worked at MES Energy from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., which included her teleworking Tuesday through Thursday and reporting to their office on Mondays and Fridays. During the time of her alleged offense, Ms. Clark earned $17,230 from MPD and $17,508 from MES Energy Services. Ms. Clark was charged with a, with a scheme and systematic course of conduct with the intent to defraud the government. The next court hearing will take place on April 25th. Thank you. This is the Office of Government Ethics, April 4th, 2004 report. Thank you, Director Cooks. Are there any questions for Director Cooks? Okay, thank you. Next on our agenda are public comments. The public was invited to submit comments in writing by 11 a.m. today. We received one comment, and it will be added to and become a part of the record for today's meeting. Members also are, of the public are in attendance are also um, extended an opportunity to make a comment at this time. Are there any members looking to make a comment? We have a written comment. Why? I don't think we have any. Uh, so we will proceed to the next agenda item, and that is the executive or closed session. This is an executive or closed session to discuss ongoing confidential investigations pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B14 to consult with an attorney to obtain legal advice and to preserve the attorney-client privilege between an attorney and a public body pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B4A to discuss personnel matters including the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, performance evaluation, compensation, discipline, demotion, removal, or resignation of government appointees, employees, or officials pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B10 to deliberate on a decision in which the Ethics Board will exercise quasi-judicial functions pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B13 and to discuss contract negotiation strategies pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B2. May I have a motion to enter into executive session? I'll offer the motion that we enter into executive session. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that the board enter into executive session. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, no nays, hearing none, um, the time is now 12.45, and we are in executive session.
119, and we are back on the record. And we have the following items to report out. The board approved negotiated dispositions in the following matters. 24-0039-P, N. Ray M. Scott. 24-0045-P, N. Ray J. Scott. And 23-0100-P and 23-010-P, N. Ray L. Graves. The board also approved a notice of violation in 23-0096-P and 23-0018-P in Ray Aretha Chapman. This concludes the meeting of the District of Columbia Board of Government Accountability, Ethics and Government Accountability, until our next meeting, which is scheduled for May 2nd at 12 noon here at 1030 15th Street Northwest. Thank you.